you know, we've been through six sessions now, and uh, some of the things that, that I posed to this group uh, um, are a little bit different. Ralph said to me, he said, Tom, those aren't the questions you sent to me. Uh, I'm just seeing how they think on their feet. Uh, the wrong things for the test. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I was just wondering from the group, uh, let's, let's start off with, with some of the stuff that we talked or that I sent to you. Uh, you know, what, what, just in general, how would you describe your experience so far with the Visioning Institute? Just in general, any of you. All of the learning that has taken place on my side causes me to filter um, routinely everything that's going on coming through a district. Uh, it causes me to think. And so from that experience alone, it's been such a tremendous benefit. It's also a little bit frightening. Uh, on more than one occasion, I uh, see that there is something that the need for a change is there to a certain degree, yet our system or systems that are in place may not be ready yet to, to take on that change. But it, it creates, at least for me, the atmosphere among my chief administrators in the district to put them in a position to question. I think the other thing that's been a great benefit has caused us, at least, in the district to use kids much more in the process of thinking through uh, how their daily learning experience is occurring. That's, that's the thing that, that strikes me as being most beneficial. Uh, after you participate in an institute like this, you become energized each time you come, and then when you go back, uh, your staff sometimes wishes that you hadn't gone. <laughs> Because you, you take the conversation to a different level, and, uh, and that's what the Institute has done for me, and it's caused me to uh, go back and to reflect and to really have a different level of conversation with, with my staff. First of all, the Student Center, uh, it's just one of my priorities is always to be very student centered and be around students and staff constantly, and you know, the importance of that. Also, all of the things uh, that we have discussed uh, and been presented with and the table conversations and everything else. Uh, you, know, you constantly go back energized. You also have time to slow down and get away from our daily routines and think about some things that will help us through this. Several of the issues are the same to me. One is just taking the conversation back and, and <clears throat> taking it up to another level. At, at every level, actually, having multiple discussions with both central administration, campus administration, staff, and then in particular having conversations with students. I think that's been really exciting to several people in the district as we started inviting more students to be engaged in the conversation. But personally, perhaps one of the things that's really challenged me in this experience is whether or not we have the will, and I say we have talked about those those of us in lead districts that we have the will to really challenge the need to to change the system completely or to at least to change the capacity of the system sometimes. I'm not sure even in my own profession if I'm working with trying to respond to the capacity of the system as it is or uh, I believe there's a real need for us to expand the capacity that has to move in a very different direction. So I ask myself sometimes if, if, if I can both the will and the courage. I really think the knowledge of how to change schools and how to improve schools is already there. I think we can talk about it in a lot of different ways with a lot of different experts, but I think that the real issue would be whether or not personally I have the, both the courage and the will to us be a part of that part of that change. And I just add one thing that, that one thing that's that I started doing is I've got the agree and disagree quotes uh, on my computer and every week at our cabinet meetings I have a, one of those and we spend the first 10 to 15 minutes just discussing it with, with our cabinet. Uh, uh, don't reach conclusions but it starts people thinking, it's kind of like Thomas said, they almost hate when you come to it because you come back with more thoughts and, and things to discuss so um, that's one thing I've taken. Um, 
Is there anything over the past six sessions that has uh, that something specific that has maybe changed the way you think, either something very specific or in general that's happened over the past six sessions that you could identify that said this caused me to change the way I thought or think about whatever issue. Field selected just really focusing in on trying to move from the bureaucracy to a, a learning organization, trying to create that culture throughout the district. That, that's one piece that's really stayed with me. The second piece, and I, I can't remember what session it was, but it stayed with me when we got into a discussion about professional development and, and, and some of the shifting that needs to take place in professional development, with most of our professional development probably focusing on on the how-to piece and, and, and probably the need to move more of our professional development into the why. For example, in this room we have uh, the leaders of the districts, and we spend a lot of time talking about the why. We spend a lot of time getting to the hard issues, the issues of purpose, and yet we, we go back to our districts with, with staff, teachers that, who are in the trenches, who spend most of their professional development talking about just the how to and, and without the why piece or without the heart piece or without the purpose piece, without changing the process and the purpose of what we do, there won't be a real fundamental change. So I think from the from the bottom up and the top down, I, I think we really need to look at how we do professional development in our district. Now the student panel that we had uh, in, uh, a few months ago uh, was very impressive and it was uh, the candid answers that they gave, you couldn't help but um, uh, have that affect your, your thinking and, and realize that we really need to spend more time talking to our students and, uh, and make sure that they're involved in their education as well. And that was the one thing that, that made the biggest impression on me. Each of the variety of speakers in some ways gave us some insight into how to think about that or do that uh, better. And I always have felt and known that kids are ready and willing to get some of our own systems kill that readiness and willingness and how we can each and every day figure out uh, ways in which we can truly engage our kids. Uh, what you've taken back to your school district and uh, one of the things that we did, uh, in fact, we're in the process of doing it right now, uh, is looking at uh, uh, Prinsky's uh, Don't Bother Me Mom, uh, I'm Learning, and that is what we're using as our book study for, uh, for this year, but we are approaching it as an online study group. Uh, one of the things that uh, we have seen is that uh, all too often <coughs> we come in and we are at 10,000 feet and we're talking uh, about things that need to be done but we never really get down to uh, uh, the level where uh, people are actually doing the work. And uh, I know that uh, what the Institute has done for me with actually going online and engaging in conversations uh, with colleagues, uh, that's something that was new for me. And uh, so uh, even though my family, uh, who are, uh, most of them are taking some type of online courses, they, they chat all the time online. And it's, and it's a simple thing for them. But in our district, we're not doing that. You may be doing it in yours, but we're not. And so we're going to model that behavior by uh, our book study now. It's totally online. And our uh, uh, oldest principal, man, you could see he was, uh, he was, in fact, you could just see his face turning redder and redder and redder because he didn't want to have anything to do with that. But it's causing us to, uh, uh, everyone that's a part of our general staff, uh, we're getting out of, our, out of our element by actually doing that. So that book study will be totally on, online. And the final product that all of us are going to be responsible for is a complete teaching guide for a game that has been used uh, uh, in our district. And that will be submitted to uh, uh, MELD.org for publication on their website. And the staff will get DMA credit if they do it on their own time. If they do it during the school day, then of course uh, they won't get DMA credit. Um, the instructional strategies that uh, meet today's children's needs is the focus. As we looked at one of the things that Plano ISD was doing, 
was using games to take and reinforce what they're trying to teach in the, in the classroom. And so we looked at what Plano was doing and we focused, we're going to focus on math, grades 6 through 8, and algebra. And uh, using Tabula, Tabula Digital, uh, that company that produces games, and uh, we've gone in and looked at uh, Dimension M, where there are a number of games that are going to be supporting what we're trying to teach in the classroom. And we're piloting this year the best instructional use, which involves initial instruction, whether or not it's reinforcement motivation, or whether or not it is acceleration or remediation. And one of the things that happened, we had two kids that uh, came in and modeled this, because one of the issues that we had concerns with is that we're going to have those teachers that are 15 years plus that are going to say you're crazy to be talking about bringing games into classroom. We, we know that. We've got administrators who have the exact same attitude. But we had two kids that played the game for our general staff. And they in turn talked about the uh, things that they learned from the game. And one of the kids that was talking, when he was talking, we were sitting there thinking he was a GT student. But really he was like they left he was, <laughs> he was, the principal stood up and said, the principal stood up and said, this kid last year was one of our most challenging kids, and the first three weeks of school has now totally turned it around, and it was because they identified him as one of the kids to take and go through. And when he was talking about modeling, uh, going through and what the game was doing for him, and reinforcing exactly the concepts that were being learned, it blew our administrators away. And the attitude was totally different on them responding to this whole notion of using games in a way that we have not used in instruction before. We, uh, we took back the panel discussion, we very similar to the principal's final, re final reference with uh, uh, district uh, level administrators and uh, went through a very similar process in front of them with a variety of different questions. Uh, one of the aspects of that uh, presentation was to have in a similar vein was to see how those kids were learning away from the school. And uh, of course the young man who brought his $4,000 laptop uh, to the table uh, had a complete new insight to that for our administrators on the things that he was doing, a variety, a variety of different things. And then questions directed back to them, again, it's very similar to the present frame of reference to how is this translating into what's occurring in your daily learning. And then a requirement to have to grades 5 through 12 to have an engagement of students in a similar discussion back at the campus level. Uh, designed by uh, our instructional department to work with kids to help understand how technology is impacting uh, their learning on a daily basis. The whole focus of that was to interpret that and bring it into a frame of reference for our teachers so that they then can see uh, the, the kinds of instruction, engaging instruction they need to think about bringing to the classroom uh, to help the kids. Staying with the student-centered effort, one of the things that, that we've done is, is I went back and looked at all of our central office personnel to, and see which ones we could move to campus. We want uh, to make sure that we're interacting as much as we possibly can every day with students and with teachers and make sure that everything we're doing is focusing that direction. So we moved several of our curriculum people as well as others to uh, campus offices rather than having them in the central office uh, because it's too easy to get in the central office and get bogged down in things every day and go on there uh, and, and lose sight of what's really going on with campus. And so we went back and looked at our entire staff and that way these moves have helped us make sure that we're connecting everything that's going on at the central administration with the campus administration and the campus students and staff. Again, a lot of mine is focused on what I consider the foundation issues of trying to get people to think differently, not only within the school, but people outside the school, and really kind of 
the issue that I think we'll be getting into today, but today in terms of what, what is my responsibility as a moral leader of the district to really talk about those things that we need to do that sometimes even challenge the system from within and, and it makes my position and my, my job a little bit more uncomfortable. But I think that's the real challenge. And I think we have some things happening nationally that really suggest that that's going to be a strong role that we have to play. So I, I, I'm trying to, one of the things that I'm trying to do is make sure, you know, make sure that we, in, in, in spring, that we're not simply changing what we do, but we're changing why we do things. That, and sometimes that's, that's, it's a little slower. You want to get to some things quickly. You want some number of results. You want, you, you want those issues that people know this quickly. But I think if we, if, if I want to fundamentally change how things are done with children for a very long time beyond my, my point, then, then a large part of that is, is being the moral intellectual leader of the district. And so that's, that to me is a challenge for that face. One of the things that, that we've started in McKinney that uh, isn't anything new, um, but after the conversation and realizing that uh, students we had the conversation where students are digital natives and we're digital immigrants because of our age. But what I also realized was not all the students are digital natives because they don't have technology in their home. And so I think if we make the assumption that they're all digital natives, we've made a mistake. And so we have taken one of our Title I bilingual campuses and we're providing the students with iPods that and then we're teaching them how to utilize those iPods with lessons on them, uh, trying to give them uh, some of the same advantages that some of our other students might have, and just trying to see what progress we can see with those kids. Uh, Carrollton Farmers Branch, I know they do that, and we kind of stole that idea from them. Uh, but uh, we're, we're seeing some real changes, but, but I think too often we, we can't make the general assumption that all students are digital natives. Uh, that uh, we've got to help them any way we can to achieve that because that's where the future is, uh, I believe, not only in education but obviously in the world. So, so we're trying to help that along. It's one of the things that we've taken back from this. Um, just kind of a, a two-part question so that I can blend it in, Thomas, and you can uh, get your answer. Uh, uh, what implications from this do you see for the future and based upon the implications that you see for the future, what are the burning questions that you still have at this point? One of the things that, that's kind of just been part of, part of me is when, when I watch educators, even when I was in the classroom, typically when you hear a group of people sitting around complaining, that really indicates to you that they're not going to do anything about what's happening. So complaining is to prepare you for the results that you're going to be getting. And, and no matter what level you operate at, I kind of find that to be true. When you hear people start complaining, they're just preparing you for the results that you're going to be getting. So it's just, it's how do we, how do we, how do we focus our energy on the things that we have control over? I mean, I, you know, the, the, instead of spending time talking about legislative issues and other issues that we really don't have a lot of control over. How do we really grab hold of the things that we can control, the things that we can influence to, to affect the type of change that, that we believe education will need 20 years down the road? Right now when I walk into the kindergarten class and I see those kids and realize that they're going to be, if we're still in the traditional system we're in now, which hopefully we won't be, but if we are, in 2020 they'll be walking across the state. How, how, do, how do we grab hold of the things that we can and really began to change fundamentally how we do things, processes and systems within our system. Well, how do we really get beyond just talking about sitting around like teachers doing the teaching lounge, talking about those things that we have absolutely no control of? Our district is very, uh, has been very progressive for many years with technology and uh, we have one of the best websites and it's the best communication tool that we have. And as we look at all of the pieces of technology and how rapid things are changing, we spend a tremendous amount of money on technology and making sure that we're doing the right things, you know, buying the right things and things that will lead us uh, the direction we need to go. We know that uh, 
the impact that technology is having on our students and our educational process is going to continue to accelerate and how are we going to meet those challenges. Uh, we, you know, sessions like this certainly uh, help at our level but we want all the way through our district to be sure that our students you know, all of them have access to the technology, all of them uh, have the best education that they can possibly have. So, uh, you know, how are we going to manage that and the changes in the rapid expansion? Change is just painful and slow. It uh, struck home recently uh, an opportunity to, to listen in on a conversation about it in a way. I don't know how many of you have seen Thing come uh, out of this. It's a result of the Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation and a bipartisan effort to build uh, candidates or to provide information about which candidates are going to have education on their agenda in a way. It's really interesting. What was interesting about the conversation was most of the things that they were pushing seemed to be very basic interests. Uh, I couldn't help but think as I was listening to all the conversations we had had uh, this year in this institute that you know, what a great opportunity maybe to connect with that somewhere along the way. Nevertheless, uh, you know, in our district, the change is slow. I think it's also slow in terms of the training uh, that our new teachers are getting coming through the universities. Not sure. My biggest question I have is, in fact, uh, those new teachers that are coming our way going to have the kind of insight necessary. They may have some of their own uh, digital native frames of reference because of the age that they are. But are they still going to be steeped in all the traditional patterns that are out there for how they deliver education? And that's a big question. In my mind, is how do we reshape the perception of non-educators and our constituents that do not have children or any association with the school? And with technology the way that it is, uh, there can be so much miss uh, of a poor information that can go out to people that once they get it, it is a challenge to take and to reshape that into the direction that I think that we need to be uh, helping people see public education and where it's going. Uh, and, and, and I see a sense of urgency. Uh, even though I've reached the rule of eight, uh, the question is, can we begin to uh, reshape uh, those thoughts from part of those individuals who really truly have a different agenda than they do. And how quickly can we get that done? Uh, David and I were, were, uh, were in a meeting uh, uh, just recently, and, and uh, I, 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 I sat there and I didn't say anything, but the legislator was really and truly being very critical about something as simple as uh, accessing the four power points. And in my opinion, if the district chose not to do that, and they're able to accomplish everything that they need to accomplish with the existing dollars, rather than bashing them, it would seem to me that they should be uh, applauded for that effort. But this person was bashing those folks who had access to power payments. And if he, if he was doing it in that environment, you know he's also doing it in an environment uh, out throughout the entire community, both local and statewide. And so when you have people who are challenging us in the public ed uh, area, and they're saying things that you and I know are incorrect, but they have a bully pulpit from which to do that, then it creates a sense of urgency on my part to try to begin to reshape the perception of those folks who have been tainted, so to speak, by individuals who really, truly do not have public ed as one of their best interests. As we talk about trying to shape or change the way people think, it's kind of, it's kind of a um, mixed bag in that our parents 
our constituency work in, in, in a world where it is a technology-based world that things are done completely different than they were done 20 years ago, but will push back when we try to change the way they remember school. Uh, it's, it's the saying, you know, we remember things the way they never were. Uh, and that, that's a challenge, in, I think, in, in trying to change the perception in the community or, or change the way we do business in the community because they remember school the way they had it. And even though they're operating in a different world, they'd like to see schools remain the same way that they were when they were in school. Uh, and I think it becomes very obvious to us uh, as you try and make that change. And so I think that's one of our greatest challenges, just what I think everybody said here, is changing that perception of the community, changing the, they have the high expectations, but they want it done in the same way that they remember doing it. So uh, I think that's one of our real challenges. I would just want you to remember the, the number of kids that are connected to this group of superintendents across state of Texas. And so it's a tremendous value uh, that this institute brings to the education scene in Texas. Uh, the conference I mentioned just recently is in another state, and all of the interesting elements of that conference were about pretty static, basic kinds of things, as opposed to a lot of the thought processes that are going through the effort of this institute. Uh, so it's just tremendous value. I applaud the SHW and pass up for, for what you're doing. Uh, and I hope that Michael Bullen has had the benefit of understanding where this conference has gone and will help us continue to address uh, ways that we can bring about change. Uh, I look forward to our discussion about more leadership is that something that feels like you said, and I'm not sure if it's here or somewhere else, but you talked about probably those school, school superintendents and school board members are, are becoming more community builders than we've ever wanted to be. And, and kind of think about what Thomas said about people out there with different agendas. Uh, I think it, it, it pulls us into those, those conversations to help reshape those conversations. I don't think because I don't think it's just a matter of people wanting to do things the way it was done when they went to school. I, I think it's a matter of them wanting the world not to change at all. The flat world is changing. Texas is rapidly changing. All of our school districts are changing. The faces of our school districts are changing. And so we have to respond to those changes. And sometimes they are undercurrent discussions that would not happen. Uh, that some of these decisions are growing out of that I think the superintendents and school board members are going to be pulled into. And, and have to use our bully pulpit to, to, to speak to some of those issues that we spoke to over 100 years ago about the purpose of education or, or, the, or the whole process of democracy and how do we, how do we maintain a democratic society uh, and what role does school play in the maintaining of that society. So I, I, I'm just excited about the discussion of things.